want to take a few minutes to thank uh, the member engagement committee led by uh, Professor Pam from UC Davis to organize these webinar events. And there will, more, will be more lectures coming. Uh, you know, that's a way that we want to uh, provide better service to our members. And also I want to introduce a little bit more for the uh, guests who signed in who are not WINNER member yet. And WINNER is the Western region, a Western North American region of a bigger organization called the International Biometric Society. So WINNER is one of the official partner for the joint statistical meeting and the committee of the presidents of statistical societies. And it was found in eight, 1948, just one year after uh, International Biometric Societies. Uh, that was found in 1947. And so this is one organization that has been dedicated who developed the quantitative methods for biomedical sciences and originally focused on mathematics statistics. But as we, the, we're moving forward, I really hope that become a local regional home for the quantitative biosciences, including data science, bioinformatics, you know, all the system biology and all these areas. So if you are not member, please feel, uh, you know, this should be your home and we welcome you to join the membership. And this year, one of our major event for the IB, uh, the winner is annual conference. So this year's annual conference will be in Anchorage, Alaska and on June 14 to 17. And I posted the web link to the, uh, the chat room. So if you are interested in, please feel, uh, look into the program and we welcome you to join us. And I want particular mention to the students, or if you're a professor, please pass the message to your students. Wiener has a long tradition to encourage students par uh, participation. And we give free membership to students as long as they are, uh, maintain student status. Uh, both either undergraduate or graduate students. And particularly in our annual meeting, we, in, we have a student paper competition and we encourage all the students to submit their research paper. For those students who submit their papers to the competition, they will receive $200 travel support and they will get free a registration and a free banquet. So this is really a, a very good benefit and we think we are dedicated to the education and this will be a great opportunity. So before uh, the last, I want to call for volunteers to continue to support WINNER. And we, we are doing a, several initiatives. And this year we want to start to explore to establish WINNER awards and what are the strategies in particular for, not only for students, but for, uh, you know, junior faculty or junior researcher and also some senior people. So I'm looking forward volunteers who, uh, from the members who are willing to contribute and like this one that we have volunteers contribute to the member engagement committee that come up with a webinar arrangement. So before I uh, closing, I want to thank Ji uh, Ying uh, Zhou, who's a student at Stanford, help us to, uh, a lot of logistics for this webinar. And also I want to thank uh, my esteemed colleague, uh, Brad Ephraim, to really start this uh, webinar uh, series. And we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Um, okay, yeah, I think you're... Yeah. So am I up now? <laughs> Hello? Good, you can start. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, thanks, Ying, and thanks to uh, uh, Wiener for uh, the opportunity to launch their uh, webinar series. Webinar seems like a particularly good idea, uh, given the current news. Um, so here we go. Somehow it's not going. Somehow it's not. Huh? Is the, here, click on the, okay, and then. There we go. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Okay, back. good. Okay. Um, so, uh, statistical regression theory uh, goes back to uh, Gauss Alejandra in the early 1800s, and especially to Galton in 1877, 
And uh, uh, we all know that uh, uh, during the 20th century, regression was uh, 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 adapted to a variety of important statistical tasks, uh, prediction of new cases, estimation of regression surfaces, and the assignment of significance to individual predictors, what I've called uh, attribution. And there's been a, most of the 20th century developed uh, uh, enormous number, amount of useful technology, especially for es estimation and attribution. Um, the 21st century has seen the rise of a new breed of pure prediction algorithms, uh, neural nets, deep learning, boosting support vector machines, random forests. Uh, recognizably in the uh, gauss galton tradition, but now operating at immense scales and, and uh, uh, working with millions of data points, maybe even more millions of uh, uh, pr predictors. And, um, and how do the new algorithms uh, relate to estimation and attribution? And that's what I wanted to talk about today. I can't get this in. I can do that. I can, yeah, okay. So uh, just uh, start out easy with uh, familiar stuff. Uh, here's the normal uh, linear regression model, uh, yi equals mu i plus epsilon i, uh, where the epsilon i's are normal zero sigma squared noise. <clears throat> and mu i is some combination of uh, known predictor vector covariate xi and an unknown parameter beta. And I've written it all at the right there uh, in uh, matrix vector matrix form, vector y equals matrix x beta plus epsilon. Uh, the, the vector y is an n vector, the matrix x is n by p, where the ith row of x is the covariate vector xi. And so uh, uh, this is a uh, uh, surface plus noise. Uh, kind of situation. In, in this case, uh, the vector y equals some linear function mu of x plus epsilon. And, uh, and you should think of mu of x as the surface that we're really trying to see, but we have trouble seeing it because of the noise epsilon. And of course, uh, mu of x doesn't have to be linear. In the more interesting cases, it's, it's a curved surface. And, and the surface uh, 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 codes uh, the scientific truth that we're trying to find that's hidden by noise. Uh, a, a tremendously fa famous uh, one of those is uh, uh, Newton's law, F equals MA, or here written as acceleration uh, equals force divided by mass. And I've drawn the, the two dimension, the uh, uh, curve, curve surface with acceleration as the uh, uh, acceleration as the response variable and uh, mass and force. So if the mass is low and the force is high, that's the uh, back corner, uh, you get a lot of acceleration. And I don't know if uh, it, there's no picture of Newton ever drawing this, but you're pretty, I'm pretty sure he did uh, since he was a master of these sorts of things. Uh, uh, but of course, uh, uh, if he tried to do the experiment, to determine uh, this second law, he would have seen something like this, uh, uh, sort of looks like Disney's Magic Mountain, a sort of scary version of it. And uh, uh, I don't know if he ever tried to do the experiment. Galileo did try to do it, uh, but it's very hard if you can't measure time very well. Uh, Galileo used a water clock and I don't think it worked very well. Uh, of course, uh, Newton was a genius and he figured these things out uh, probably more by into uh, physical ideas than actual experimentation, but I'm not so sure about that. He was a master of experimentation also. Uh, but the, uh, uh, the crucial thing, the point of this, is that uh, uh, the, when we do a regression model, uh, we have in mind some kind of scientific truth that's underlying uh, the, the noisy data we see and, and the purpose of the statistical methods is to peel away the noise and see the uh, truth, the scientific truth underneath. Uh, so here's, a, here's 
a more interesting, uh, here's a more statistical kind of example. Uh, uh, this is a, um, uh, a, a uh, trial of, of the drug cholestyramine, uh, one of the early uh, cholesterol-lowering drugs. Uh, this experiment was done in the uh, 1970s. Uh, 164 men, they were men, these days there'd be men and women, took cholestyramine for a long time. And for each man, they measured two things, uh, uh, CI, the normalized compliance, how much they take and they did pill counts, and YI, the reduction in cholesterol. So of course, what they hope to see is the more they took, uh, the more the uh, uh, cholesterol went down. And the model there uh, is the normal linear regression model, YI equals XI transpose beta plus epsilon I where X and I, XI is one CI, CI squared, CI cubed, which is to say that we're doing uh, cubic linear regression. Uh, and uh, uh, this is, uh, here I've done it. Uh, of course, all I did is use uh, the R program <clears throat> that said uh, linear M, LM. Uh, the green dots are the uh, 164 points. Uh, the compliance has been normalized, so it runs from about minus two to plus two. And the uh, black line is the cubic, fitted cubic regression. And you see that the black line is trying to tell us what's underneath the noisy points. Uh, the little red things are plus or minus one standard error of estimation. Uh, so we're getting accuracy as well as a point estimate. And if you'll notice up at the left hand corner, it says adjusted R squared. 0.481, so that's a predictive kind of uh, idea. So we're doing classical uh, standard regression theory, and here we here the uh, surface is the is the, the estimated surface is the black line, and the noise is what's throwing those green points away from the line. Um, here here's a uh, uh, another more recent example. Uh, the neonate example. Uh, there's a hundred, in this case, there's 800 babies in an African facility for very sick babies. Uh, 600 lived and 200 died, usually within a couple of weeks. And of course, the doctors <clears throat> very much wanted to be able to predict the ones that were going to die so that they could give them more extensive treatment. Um, <laughs> Sorry, one moment. And uh, the, um, uh, there are 11 covariates in this case uh, for each baby, APGAR score, body weight, respiratory. Just take it off the hook. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, the, uh, and we're doing, a, I'm going to do a logistic regression. Um, uh, with n equals 800 and p equals 11. So I did, uh, using r, I did glm y uh, uh, twiddle x binomial, where x, the structure matrix, is uh, 800 by 11. The ith row of x is the 11 numbers for that for ith baby. Y i in this case is uh, 1 or 0 as the baby uh, dies or lives and xi is the i throw of x. So then this is, so <clears throat> this is the surface plus noise. Again, uh, with, uh, uh, in this case, the surface is a linear logistic and the noise is uh, Bernoulli noise. So let's see what we got from that. Uh, here's the usual output. Uh, incidentally, the, very, the predictors have been standardized. So they each have mean zero and variance one. And uh, the uh, table here, guest is uh, gestational age. Its estimate is negative minus 0.474. So that means that more age, uh, less chance of dying. Uh, AP is APGAR score, et cetera. At the far right are the p-values and the asterisks these days somehow a little controversial. Um, but we, uh, I find them always quite useful. Uh, so uh, five of the uh, twelve of the eleven predictors are uh, very significant, uh, 
and it says at the upper left hand corner we can use this model for prediction also it made uh, 15 percent errors in predicting living or dying okay so um, that's the uh, uh, th that's just a little review of this traditional theory. And now let's get into what I was going to talk about, uh, how the uh, pure prediction algorithms. So uh, a small collection of what might be called pure prediction algorithms have achieved enormous popularity, uh, random forest, support vector machines, boosting, and especially these days, the neural net program, deep learning. And these are quite different from each other and quite different from classical methods, uh, but all begin uh, with the, uh, the same kind of data set. It's up at the top there. Bold face D is a collection of, uh, of, uh, of n pairs, xi, yi, where xi is the vector of p predictors and yi is the response. So in the neonate case, uh, D would have 800 uh, pairs in it. Each one would have 11 predictors, xi and one response, yi is zero. And uh, uh, the uh, and in use, n may be enormous, and p even more enormous. Uh, but we'll start with uh, the smaller examples. So, uh, uh, what do the prediction algorithms do? Uh, the algorithms use d to construct a prediction rule, f of x d, uh, that given a new case, x outputs. Uh, prediction y hat equals f of x d, which we hope will be a good prediction. So a new case comes in, a new baby, and uh, you can measure the 11 predictors, and you're going to predict whether the baby's at high risk of dying or not. And the, uh, the basic strategy is simple, uh, uh, to forget completely about surface and noise and go directly for prediction. And this is a strategy that's proved immensely successful in certain things, and less successful in other things. And that's what I wanted to talk about today. So uh, I wanted to try and, uh, uh, I wanted to try and uh, uh, describe at least one of these prediction algorithms are complicated, uh, uh, but the least complicated one is uh, random forests. And I was going to try and at least describe uh, what ra how random forest works. I know many of the people know this quite well, but not everybody. I didn't know it quite well before I started thinking about this. Um, so, uh, and random forests, uh, I have to take a little digression to talk about regression trees. Um, uh, what are regression trees? We have, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about classification. Classification is prediction when you have only bivariate resp dichotomous response. Uh, uh, zeros and ones lived and died. <clears throat> so we have n cases, uh, uh, n naught equal of them are zeros and n one of them are ones. And we have uh, p predictors features. Uh, so in the ne neonate case, n was 800, n naught was 600, n one was 200, and p was 11. And the uh, a classification tree, uh, also most famously known as CART, uh, splits the uh, 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 starts out by splitting the uh, n cases into two groups, choosing one predictor and one threshold to make the two groups as dissimilar as possible in terms of their responses. Ideally, you could put all the zeros in one case and all the ones in the other case, and you'd be through, but that never happens. And then uh, now you have them split into two cases, then you split the splits. Etc. and go on to get to some stopping rule. So here's a picture of it for the, uh, I applied it uh, to uh, uh, the neonate data. And at the top, uh, uh, it's in the first split it made was for CPAP. Uh, that's an airway blockage kind of method thing. And not having that is good. The way this is set up, uh, the good cases, the ones predicting you're gonna, the baby's gonna live, go to the left. The uh, going to the right is the bad way, and I followed the blue line down to a bad case. Uh, so in this case, if CPAP was big, uh, that's bad, you go right. 
you go down, the next thing you get to is uh, uh, get just, that's gestational age. Uh, in this case, that big is good, bad, uh, small is bad, that's to the right. And you wind up at a um, terminal node with, uh, in this case, 41 babies, 40 of whom died and one of whom lived. So this has been a very effective two splits. Uh, you've gotten, if, you, if a baby comes in who is uh, 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 high on CPAP and, uh, and low on gestational age, uh, they get predicted to be uh, in the bad category, the death category. At the far right, uh, things go the other way. And uh, you get down finally, uh, at the far left there over the green dot, there's a, cat, the best you can do is get to a, a terminal node that has about uh, 544 alive and 73 dead. And uh, there's actually seven nodes in all, three of which you'd predict, uh, three of which you'd predict uh, living and uh, four dead. And this is, there's something quite satisfying. So if a new baby comes in, you can use the, the, this tree to predict whether it's going to live or die by simply following the baby's covariates down the uh, uh, tree and going seeing where you wind up. Uh, and that's pretty good. But the uh, people using this for prediction found, even though the trees look nice, they aren't really very stable predictors. Uh, and there we get to the first of the uh, uh, first of the uh, uh, the simplest of the uh, uh, very successful pure prediction algorithms. Uh, random forest. This is uh, Leo Bryman, 2001, one of his brilliant ideas. If, if one tree isn't going to be very good at prediction, uh, the idea here is to draw a lot of bootstrap trees and average the results and try and do better. So the algorithm, you, uh, you start out with our data set D. Uh, at the first uh, uh, the first thing you do is draw a bootstrap data set, n draws from the end with replacement, and uh, 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 you um, uh, uh, then uh, 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 use that tree to uh, use that uh, data set to uh, uh, use that data set to uh, uh, make a tree, except uh, at each split, you only use a random set of the predictors. And you do this all a lot of times, a thousand times. And uh, uh, now you have a thousand uh, classification trees. And if a new baby comes in, you, you push, put its 11 predictors down all a thousand trees and you do a uh, majority vote. And that sounds sort of hokey. Uh, it sounded sort of hokey to me when I first heard it uh, from Leo in 2001, but it's had a remarkable uh, uh, record of success, and I'll show you that. So I'm going to apply uh, random forest uh, uh, to, uh, that's the random forest algorithm. I'm going to apply it. Uh, to um, the uh, prostate cancer microarray study. A hundred men in this study, uh, 50 with prostate cancer, 50 normal controls. And uh, for each man uh, the, the was measured on a microarray with 6,033 genes. And the data set in this case, and I, there's a mistake in my slide here. I meant to say the uh, uh, matrix, the data matrix X of uh, pre predictions is 100 by 63, 6,033, a wide data, as they say. That is, if you had the matrix actually printed out, it would look very wide. And uh, we want a prediction rule, f of xd, uh, that uh, inputs a new 6,033 vector x and outputs y hat, uh, correctly predicting whether they're in the cancer or normal case. And this is a data set I've had a lot of experience with it before, and it's not very easy to do prediction with it, or at least uh, what I was more interested in was attribution, which, uh, uh, which of the genes were important. But here we're going to do try and do prediction, pure prediction. So uh, following uh, standard advice, I uh, 
uh, of how, how to do this in the prediction literature, I randomly divided the uh, 200, the 100 subjects into a training set of 50 subjects uh, with 25 normals and 25 cancer patients and a test set of the other 50, 25 plus 25. And I ran uh, the R program, Random Forest, on the training set. And I'm going to use its rule, f of x d, d train, Um, I'm going to use its rule f of x d train on the test set to see how many errors it makes. And incidentally, I should say that usually the best advice I would put 80 in the training set and 20 in the test set. But here I, want to I wanted to get a better picture of how many errors were being made. So I, I put more into the uh, test set, less into the training set. And here's what happened. Uh, the uh, red curve is the crucial one here. Uh, it's, the, uh, it's the number of errors that the training rule made on the test set. So the training rule didn't get to look at the test set. So this is an honest measure of error. And, the, and the, as the number of, uh, of uh, random forest trees increased, the uh, uh, test set error decreased. That's the red curve. And you see it got really quite low. It got down to 2%, uh, which was uh, one error out of, uh, out of 50. That is, the rule based on the training set uh, correctly predicted 49 out of 50 of the, uh, of the uh, uh, test set. I thought quite remarkable. And here's, here's, another, uh, here's another method. This is GBM. Uh, Another of the famous methods, uh, famous peer prediction algorithm, uh, uh, gradient boosting modeling. It also uses trees, but in a quite uh, different way. It uses uh, what are called, the, the way I'm using it here, it's using stumps. That is just little trees. One, uh, each of the trees, uh, only choice one variable and one split. And, but it, it, it uses them in a different way than uh, uh, then random forests, it builds up the prediction uh, rule at, by addition, each time adding one new stump and, uh, um, uh, and uh, choosing the new, new stump to reduce prediction errors as much as possible. And uh, uh, the, um, here's, how, here's how this one did. Uh, the black curve is the training set error, went quickly to zero as the number of trees increased. Uh, the uh, test set error went down to about 2% again at about 200 trees, but then eventually went up to about uh, 4%. That is two errors out of 50, still very good. Um, and, uh, and the language of boosting is a very good language. Uh, in the colorful language they use, the, the individual stumps are called uh, uh, weak learners. That is in by themselves, uh, they don't do very much prediction, maybe 52%, 48% errors or something like that. But the, um, uh, the amazing uh, fact is that you can put together a lot of weak learners to make a strong learner. And that's, that's one of the key results of the uh, uh, prediction movement. And uh, I, it's quite amazing how, how, uh, how nicely that works. It's worked here, for example. Um, so uh, I thought I'd better do a deep learning example too, just to be complete here. Uh, this is the uh, deep learning program from the package Keras. And here things are upside down. The, uh, uh, instead of the error rates, it's the uh, non-errors. And the uh, green curve is the uh, uh, validation or test set errors. And it didn't do quite as well. It made... Uh, uh, seven or eight errors out of uh, 50. This is not a really good kind of example for uh, deep learning. Um, and okay, and now I was, uh, I was pretty impressed by all this, um, uh, given how hard I've worked on this data set and I never got anywhere, I never thought you could predict this well. Um, and there's, uh, many reasons that prediction, I, I tried to think about why 
things were going so well. Um, and uh, some of the reasons have to do with uh, how clever the algorithms are, of course. Uh, but one, one sort of meta reason that I, I, I vaguely convinced myself of, at least, is that prediction is easier than estimation or attribution in some basic sense. Uh, so here's a, uh, here's a, a rough example, a uh, simple example to, to say why prediction is easier than estimation. Uh, and in this example, uh, we observe uh, x1 through x25 independent normal mu1 with mu of the unknown mean, standard elementary statistics problem. And we are considering two possible ways to estimate mu x bar the mean or x perp the median. And uh, uh, for estimation, uh, x uh, the median is much worse than the mean. The, in terms of expected squared error, the ratio using the uh, uh, median is 1.5 times, seven times the uh, expected squared error using the mean. So you lose more than 50% uh, uh, by not using the most efficient estimator. But now let's change from doing estimation to prediction. Suppose we want to, we observe one more uh, 26th value x naught from normal mu one. And all we want to do is use the previous 25 to predict uh, x naught. Uh, we don't get to see x naught, we're going to do predict one of them. And then the, the ratio of prediction error still favors the mean over the median but now the ratio is only 1.02. That is, there's only a 2% chance uh, uh, of 2% uh, uh, of, uh, uh, improvement uh, by using uh, the more efficient estimator X bar. And uh, for the, the lesson here is that for prediction purposes, we can use inefficient estimators uh, that are more convenient for large scale applications. And uh, I think that's an important lesson. What about attribution? Um, it says prediction is, is easier than attribution. Uh, uh, the uh, attribution, if you remember, is the word I'm using sort of rather than significance testing or something. So here I've made up a, uh, uh, another microarray study. It's sort of like the real one we had. <clears throat> we have... Um, We have N genes. Uh, <clears throat> maybe we have a treatment group and a, uh, a cancer and control group. <clears throat> and uh, uh, for each one, each gene then gives us a uh, uh, two sample test statistics ZJ, which in my uh, high case here is normal delta J1, where delta J is the effect size. And delta J is zero for null genes. That's most of them usually, and not of them. But for some of the genes, a small number and one of them, uh, there is a big difference between the two groups and delta J is uh, positive, non-null genes. And now a new subject's microarray comes in, XJ, and the way I have this set up, uh, if the person is uh, uh, in the sick group, cancer group say, uh, they're normal plus delta J1. If they're in the uh, uh, healthy group, they're minus. So if we knew which, uh, which genes were uh, uh, the affected ones, it would be easy to see whether you were uh, easy to uh, attribute uh, uh, sickness or healthiness. And um, uh, the question is, uh, uh, for this slide, how small can N1 be before you can't do prediction anymore? Uh, so you have a huge haystack of N0 null cases and plus N1 non-null cases, uh, how small can N1 be uh, before you can't do the prediction? And the theory, which I won't try and say anything about today, is a, it's uh, effective prediction is possible if N1 is order N0 to the one half. So if N0 was uh, uh, 10, if you had 10,000 genes, maybe N1 would be 100 or 200 or something like that. Uh, but however, attribution, uh, requires N1 to be an order of magnitude bigger, order of N0 itself. And um, uh, the reason this happens, it has to do again with weak learners. Uh, prediction allows you to, to agglomerate 
a large number of uh, weak learners into one strong learner. But that's just exactly what attribution doesn't do. Attribution is trying to pick out the, strong, the individual strong learners. And the point of this slide is that's harder to do. Um, so prediction and manageable science. Um, I, I was surprised and impressed that Random Forest made only one error out of 50. Uh, uh, and uh, this made me think, why don't we just use uh, uh, this Random Forest result to do prediction of whether man's going to be, it um, uh, uh, comes in, we, did, we do the microarray, and then we can just see whether or not he's going to have, uh, be in the pr prostate cancer uh, situation. And in fact, things like this are being done in lots of different, uh, 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 for lots of different diseases, but there is a uh, reason for caution. And the reasons for caution have to do with the fact that there isn't any underlying uh, surface being found by these methods. And uh, I wanted to talk about this a bit about, uh, this is the downside of these predictor algorithms. So, um, it turns out that uh, 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 random forest does produce a, um, uh, a, uh, a measure of importance for the individual predictors. In this case, in the case of the um, microarray study, the actual microarray study, the prostate cancer study, uh, it gave something like uh, uh, 1,500 non-zero predictors, uh, importance numbers, of which two of them were much bigger uh, than, the, than the others, gene number 1022 and gene number 5569. They're the two points up at the upper left there. So this seems like a, uh, a good hint for uh, attribution. Maybe those two genes are really important. Uh, and I took out the two genes and reran the random forest. That now I only had 6,031 predictors, and I still got almost perfect. Uh, uh, prediction. So I took out the top five, the top 50, the top 100, the top 500. And each time the same thing happened, I'd, I'd get on either zero, one, or two, or three prediction errors. Um, and uh, this, this surprised me. Uh, and, and when I thought about it, uh, it did seem to fit in with the, the idea that these prediction algorithms, or at least random force in this particular case, uh, work by agglomerating weak predictors. And there's a lot of weak predictors, and it doesn't matter which, very much which set you use, you still get pretty good prediction. And that's, that's uh, great for prediction, but it's the opposite of what you want for attribution. Um, and here's, here's a, a more serious concern about the prostate cancer predictions. Uh, uh, do, do you really believe that the error rate is only one out of 50? And this, this comes down uh, to a question about the training set methodology. And if you remember, uh, I, I followed the advice in the literature and I chose uh, from my 100 full subjects, I chose the training set uh, randomly. That means I chose the test set randomly too. Uh, and that's the usual advice. And it seems like good advice, uh, but I got a little suspicious. So uh, the uh, uh, prostate cancer data set, uh, the uh, subjects are la labeled one through 100. And incidentally, it's not my own data. This was data from the web uh, quite a while ago. And um, uh, instead, of, uh, instead of randomly dividing them, I took the 50th with the smallest uh, uh, numbers, the 50 that I suspected came in first in the, in the uh, experiment, the actual study. I made that the training set and I used the 50 latest for the test set. Each one of them still had 25 uh, cancer patients and 25 normal controls. And I reran a uh, random forest and things didn't work out as well this time. Uh, the black curve here is the training set errors on the training set. The training set rule applied to the training set. It quickly went to 0% errors. 
the red curve is the one we care about. The uh, uh, training set rule applied to the test set. And here things didn't work out as well. Instead, uh, we got 24% errors. Uh, that is 12 errors out of, uh, 12 errors out of uh, uh, the 50 predictions, not as good. And let's see, I tried it with GBM also and got about the same uh, results. Uh, actually, it uh, uh, got up to uh, about 15 errors here this time. Um, and uh, so, so the question arises, why is prediction worse now? Uh, and, it, and it really isn't obvious to inspection uh, but the prostate study uh, subjects appear to have been collected in the order listed, maybe with small differences uh, coming in as the people got better at running the experiment or with something changed. And, uh, uh, and, and one thing that's in the, uh, that seems possible is that the weak learners underlining, underlying random forest and GBM uh, seem to have been uh, vulnerable to the slight changes in condition. And, and this is well known in the prediction literature. It goes under various names. The one I like best is called concept drift. Uh, a famous example being the uh, Google flu predictor uh, that beat the CDC uh, the first three years and then collapsed entirely in the fourth year it was applied. And, uh, uh, and, and choosing one's test set by random selection uh, from the full set of cases can be a dangerous practice um, it, it, it almost guarantees that you won't see anything like concept drift. And here, uh, there's some reason to believe that there was such a, such a. Okay, so this slide is uh, called truth, accuracy, and smoothness. And whenever you see a word like truth, uh, there's always uh, the danger that philosophy is about to break out. Uh, and there is a little philosophy here. Um, uh, science historically has been the search for the underlying truths that run our universe. Uh, truths like Newton's laws that are supposed to be eternal. And the eternal part is clear enough in physics and astronomy, uh, speed of light, uh, Hubble's law, etc. And maybe in biology and medicine too. And uh, science has moved into situations like uh, uh, where truth may not be as eternal like economics, but still we expect truth to, uh, uh, we expect uh, when we're doing science that what we're finding is gonna last for a while. And, and classical estimation and attribution search for underlying relationships hidden beneath the uh, statistical noise, what I call the surface and the surface plus noise model plays the role of truth. And uh, nothing rules out uh, truth seeking for the prediction algorithms, uh, but they've been most famously applied to more ephemeral relationships uh, like credit scores or Netflix movie recommendations or image cats versus dogs uh, kind of uh, recognition. And, and the ability, their ability uh, uh, to extract useful information, uh, even if it's of short term use from large messy heterogeneous uh, data collections is a great advantage of uh, uh, deep learning, boosting, et cetera. Uh, notions of theoretical optimality, uh, maximum likelihood and name and Pearson lemma uh, uh, rule the choice of uh, uh, methods in traditional statistics. Uh, we don't have those in uh, the underlying the pure prediction algorithms. Uh, instead, there's these training test set kinds of things. Um, uh, one more difference in points of view, uh, the more the typical surface plus noise model uh, follows the Newton Laplace view of the universe as being smooth. And uh, uh, that's an important part of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the situation that isn't incorporated into the, uh, into the pure prediction algorithms. So here I've, um, <clears throat> I applied uh, random forests uh, <clears throat> to the uh, <clears throat> cholestyramine, uh, to the cholestyramine thing, the cubic regression there is the 164 men who took 
uh, cholesterol lowering drugs. Here's the cubic regression again, that's the red curve. And the um, random forest did do an increasing prediction with compliance of response, but definitely not, uh, uh, not smooth. Uh, it, it's as rough as could be. Um, GBM was smoother but still uh, not really smooth. There, nothing is put into the prediction algorithms to make them do smoothness. I, I, it's not like it's impossible that they couldn't, but uh, uh, that's not one of the things that's uh, been seemed to be uh, uh, desired. So, um, Uh, the, um, the, um, much of the talk so far has been devoted to the distinction between classical estimation met methodology and pure prediction algorithms. And this is a, a summary sheet of the differences plus a few more. And uh, uh, this is broad brush stuff. You can find ex counter examples to all of them, but I think the points are um, useful to think about. Uh, one, uh, surface plus noise. Uh, the classical surface plus noise model focuses estimation on the most possible, accurate possible assessment of the surface, while the prediction algorithms focus on low prediction error. And both sides use some form of least squares in the fitting process, but different objectives in mind. And doing away with the surface has a whole lot of downstream uh, uh, consequences that most of the rest of the points are. Uh, first of all, estimation, uh, that's second scientific truth. Estimation tends to have a longer time scale than prediction. An estimated surface uh, represents an attempt at scientific truth, uh, maybe not eternal truth, but at least long lasting. Uh, prediction methods can also be comfortable with ephemeral relationships that only remain valid until the next update. And that's really a big advantage if that's what you want to do. That's less an advantage if you're looking for something that lasts a while. <clears throat> Three, um, in terms of the N by T P structure matrix X, uh, classical traditional methods like to have P less than N. It used to be a rule, P should be like say one fifth of N at most. Uh, the uh, prediction algorithms glory in having P greater than N and possibly much greater. Uh, and sometimes uh, in some of the more enthusiastic literature, uh, talks of n equals all, uh, where all possible cases are fed into the computer and the algorithm does the science for you, making uh, actual scientists redundant. Uh, four, in classical practice, uh, 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 the covariates that form the columns of x are chosen parsimoniously. Uh, main effects first, not too many interactions. And anti-parsimony uh, rules the prediction algorithms uh, 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 with the algorithms themselves expand the number of predictors enormously, for instance, by making up trees from various predictors. And uh, uh, the um, uh, in five, um, parametric modeling uh, plays a central role in estimation theory. Uh, well, the, uh, the uh, prediction algorithms are mostly non-parametric. Uh, the only thing that's usually assumed is that the XY pairs are independent of each other. Um, and estimation since Fisher's time has uh, uh, conditioned on the X's the ancillaries where that's not done uh, on the non-parametric, on the prediction side. Uh, which uh, uh, makes theory, uh, both of these things, not using parametric models and not conditioning, make theory more difficult to carry out on the uh, prediction side. And there has, there's a lot of theory on the prediction side, but it's mainly theory of computer science kind of uh, scalability. Um, uh, six there, um, estimation and even so more so attribution works best with, best with homogeneous data sets uh, where the XY pairs follow the same basic structure and a, ran, a randomized clinical trial is the extreme. Usually you try and get the subjects uh, to be all one narrow disease class. Um, 
the uh, uh, not requiring homogeneity makes prediction algorithms much more widely applicable and is a great virtue in terms of generalizability of results, but a defect for interpretability. And finally, seven, um, th theory of optimal estimation. Applied estimation is based on a century of theoretical development with maximum likelihood playing a central role. Uh, for the prediction algorithms, uh, theoretical efficiency is replaced by empirical training test set calculations. And this has a, a big virtue in doing away with theoretical modeling, which of course can be wrong. Uh, but the lack of a firm uh, theoretical structure has led to uh, uh, many flowers blooming. Uh, the popular peer prediction algorithms differ completely from one another. And, and during the last 25 years, uh, first neural nets, then support vector machines, boosting random forest and neural nets um, in their deep learning revival have enjoyed the prediction spotlight. And, you can, and we're probably going to have more of them coming on. It says CTF there, that stands for the Common Task Framework. Uh, these are various organized prediction competitions uh, that have been used to grade algorithms. Uh, the Netflix movie recommendation contest being best known. And, and uh, none of this is a good sub substitute for a theory of efficient prediction, but we haven't come up with one yet. And uh, th there's a thriving asymptotic literature in the uh, prediction side, but as I said, it's mainly about uh, uh, computational questions. Um, so what, and this is sort of a little coda to what I've been saying. Um, the uh, whether or not you like the pure prediction algorithms, they've had a terrific effect on traditional statistics by example of what could be done in a different uh, framework, uh, frame of mind. And uh, uh, these wide data problems where uh, the X matrix is much wider than it's tall, that is where P is much bigger than N. Uh, these are problems that uh, 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 the, the traditional theory wants to attract, attack also. And uh, uh, the, the uh, traditional theory starts uh, stuttering when P gets big. Uh, so, for example, MLEs, maximum likelihood estimates, can be badly biased for individual parameters. And is it really sensible to talk of a surface at all if, say, P is 6,033? Um, uh, well, that hasn't stopped us from going ahead, us being the traditionalists. Uh, uh, big data is not the sole possession of the prediction algorithms. Uh, statisticians are inventing new tactics for doing classical inference on massive data sets. Uh, GWAS, uh, genome-wide association studies are prime candidates. And these are big by anybody's standard. And the one I'll just show you in a second um, from Ikram and all on microcirculation of the eye. There are 4,000 subjects and a million SNPs, N by P. So the data matrix was uh, huge indeed and very, very wide. So here's the uh, uh, usual, uh, uh, the famous uh, Manhattan plot, where there's, there's supposed to be a million points there. Of course, they get plotted over each other. Uh, on the, uh, and what's plotted is uh, for each of the one million SNPs, uh, a separate little linear regression was done, uh, seeing how much, uh, how much of the uh, 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 the uh, uh, response variable varied. In this case, it, it had to do with uh, circulation of uh, the eye uh, uh, as a function of whether you had zero, one, or two of the uh, SNPs. Uh, and uh, uh, and a, a few of the genes, uh, so the, a p-value was gotten for each of the individual SNPs. And the uh, what's plotted is minus log 10 of p. And the uh, upper dash line is the Bonferroni bound, uh, three times 10 to the eighth, uh, uh, three times 10 to the minus eighth of how big it has to be to take account of multiplicity. And the uh, Ikram and all claim that they found four or five new locations on the uh, genome that affected 
uh, microcirculation. So the tactic here is interesting, right, from a statistical point of view. Instead of trying to do uh, one traditional regression attribution analysis with a million data points, uh, instead a million separate attribution results were done individually, and then a second level of uh, a second level of inference was done to comb through these. And here's another uh, here's another tactic that's gotten very popular. Uh, uh, sparse models in the lasso. Uh, maybe we have way too many, uh, matrix X is way too wide, so we can't do ordinary linear regression, say, but we can do penalized regression. And uh, we assume the method, these methods like the lasso, uh, assume that you, uh, that you really don't need all the predictors. There's just a few of them that are important. They go directly for attribution and uh, they do a sort of penalized, they do a form of penalized least squares. And this, this has been very effective. And uh, it's somewhere in between classical ordinary least squares and the boosting algorithms. Uh, and it has the advantage, some of the advantages of both. Uh, uh, it, it's interpretable, but still can be applied to a very wide data sets. So that's, um, pretty much the story here. Uh, uh, the success of the peer prediction algorithms uh, came as a big surprise to me and a welcome surprise after I got over being defensive. Uh, they added an, an energy jolt to the statistics discipline and the benefits go both ways. Uh, as statisticians uh, bringing the ideas of scientific inference to bear on the prediction problem. And so I said two hopeful trends. Uh, the first trend is making the prediction algorithms better for scientific use, uh, smoother, uh, uh, more, which I think is more important than people uh, tend to get, say, uh, more interpretable, that everybody says that's important, and less brittle, uh, less given to uh, uh, this worry about the test set and the training sets, uh, changing things. Uh, going in the other direction, uh, the success of the peer prediction algorithms has encouraged uh, making traditional regression tools uh, better for large-scale NP problems. Less, fuss <coughs> less fussy, more flexible, better scaled. <coughs> and so uh, the talks I hear these days from my younger colleagues, that's all of them. Uh, bristle with energy and ideas connected with the two trends. And I like to think we may be on the verge of another golden age of statistics, perhaps as good as the one started by Pearson and Fisher and Neyman and others a century ago. So my thanks to you. Here's uh, some of the uh, uh, more important uh, references. Uh, the one <laughs> that I forgot to put on here, uh, I've now written a paper uh, on this talk and it's going to appear in uh, JASA with, uh, with uh, uh, discussion. So my thanks again to uh, Wainar. Yeah, so thanks, Professor Efron, for a wonderful lecture. And so now is the Q&A session. And so I already see some uh, questions in the chat box. Uh, so you can put your uh, questions there uh, if you uh, still have uh, some. And so uh, let's uh, just uh, uh, look at uh, uh, the questions. Oh, good. Okay, so. So it says, um, could the performance from the test set be better than that from the training set? Uh, two examples get different results. Uh, usually, uh, usually it works out that the training set does almost perfectly and the test set isn't as good. Uh, in that first example I gave, it worked out the other way, but that's just a matter of random noise. Um, Yeah. 
it says there is some literature showing that one can detect association, e.g. using a metric such as odds ratio, in cases where prediction accuracy is not good. How do we reconcile that with the idea that prediction is easier than estimation? Well, uh, that's from Scott. Uh, uh, the, um, the people are certainly working on trying to get uh, good attribution uh, out of these prediction methods. Uh, um, so far, uh, I haven't gone to talks where that's been very, uh, very effective. But like my second trend, my first trend was that this is going to work sooner or later. Uh, I do think that uh, uh, prediction is basically an easier uh, aspect because of the method, the fact that I said I said that prediction allows you to put together a lot of poor predictors into making a good predictor. And any any time I've worked with the data sets with that in mind, I can see it happening. Um, and uh, attribution is 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 basically a different kind of animal. It's, it's, uh, 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 you're really trying to find something for the ages when you uh, attribute it. But I, I, I won't claim that it's never going to uh, uh, work. I just came the, the way things are now. It says uh, from uh, Her Hermanson, uh, with selection of training and test samples by early versus late observations, induce greater differences in training versus test sets than a random selection. Yes, it did in this particular case. Um, another one, are the slides available online? Um, I don't know, I, 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 I'd be glad to make them available. Yeah, uh, so everyone, yes, the slides and the video link uh, will be available on the Wingner website, uh, so oh, you can oh. check that. <laughs> oh, great. Okay, that answers that question. <laughs> so, uh, from Jack Lee, uh, which approach is more promising for precision medis medicine, estimation or prediction? Well, suppose you're a, a diagnostician, you're a doctor treating prostate cancer. Uh, uh, prediction uh, is, is what's going to be uh, of your next uh, subject. Is, is definitely the most important thing. And th in that case, uh, these kind of prediction algorithms uh, really are promising. Uh, however, if you're a, in a research scientist trying to figure out what's causing prostate cancer, <clears throat> then you definitely want um, estimation and attribution as your first. Uh, From uh, Ruth Etziani, uh, how is lasso between classical OLS and boosting? Can you elaborate? Well, um, the uh, it, it one thing about the lasso is the estimates are not unbiased estimates. They tend to be biased strongly towards zero, uh, sort of the way uh, uh, James Stein shrinkage estimates are very similar to that, and uh, that's good for prediction and not as good for trying to isolate the effects of individual predictors, but the, uh, the lasso is close enough to um, standard OLS that you can really at least feel like you're uh, attributing things successfully and people have been quite successful at doing it. Uh, so uh, the way I felt in using it, I, I like to use the program Glimnet, say for, uh, which is the lasso form for say, uh, um, uh, the uh, logistic regression, uh, you do have a feeling. Uh, so uh, my colleagues here, like uh, Trevor Hasty and Rob Tipsharani, tell me what they do first often with a new data set is do one of the prediction algorithms, usually random forest because it's easy to use, see how well your prediction goes, and then go to something like the lasso uh, to try and uh, do something where you can do uh, where you get pretty good prediction, but also pretty good attribution and estimation. So that's the way, maybe it's just my feeling that it's in between, but I think it actually is. Um, from uh, uh, Deng Yu Zhang, uh, you have 50 earlier subjects in the training set and 50 later subjects in the testing. Uh, 
should it be randomly selected instead of, of in order to avoid bias due to timing? Uh, now that's ex that's ex the random one is what I did first, and that mixed them up, and that's the advice in the literature because it does avoid biases, but those biases are important biases because if time is going on, things are changing. Uh, you're fooling yourself about the prediction error. That bias is the prediction error you're going to get in the future. Uh, from Zhao, um, what happens if, if some or many of the features in the test data set are not in the original training data? How, how will, will uh, prediction extrapolate? Seems more robust than the classroom regression given the pooling of weak learners. Um, well, as a matter of fact, uh, for the uh, uh, neonate data, we did get another next year's uh, set of um, babies. The 800 were for one year, and then we got them some 300 for the next year. And it was really hard uh, with the traditional method, uh, logistic regression, it actually worked pretty well on the last year's prediction worked pretty well on next year's. And I did not uh, try and apply uh, uh, the prediction algorithms here, sorry to say. Um, from, uh, from Ying, I guess, uh, Brad, what, what, when is your vision of bridging estimation and prediction in the high dimensional case? What new techniques uh, need to be developed? Uh, well, that's a, a basic important question. And um, uh, I guess it's a good one to end with. Uh, the, uh, 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 what the statistics, what our uh, illustrious predecessors did not provide for us is a optimal theory of prediction. Uh, which is another way to say is an optimal theory of biased estimation. And uh, uh, that, that's what I think uh, people should be working on. Uh, well, I know that's what people are working on is trying. We just don't know what's an optimal way to predict. So deep learning does good on something. Maybe something else could do much better. Uh, These are the kind of questions that you can't settle right now. And that's why there's been so much diversity in the kinds of methods produced. So I think the ball is definitely in our court if R is the theoretical statisticians uh, and the uh, traditional applied statisticians of, of coming up with a theory that says how you best do these things. My thanks again. Okay, on behalf of Wina, I would like to thank uh, Professor Ifron again for a wonderful lecture. Uh, I would also like to uh, thank everyone for attending. Uh, we hope to see you soon again. And uh, so if you have any feedback or questions, you can contact the Wiener Member Engagement Committee. Uh, so thank you and have a nice day.